America, a nation of over 330 million. That's twice the population of Russia. That's a lot of souls. Enough to pack stadiums upon stadiums of people. So why are these millions of Americans stuck between just two colors when there is an entire spectrum to choose from? Where is the rest of America? What's up with this? Just the red and the blue. Years upon years and years and it continues. Is it designed to work exactly the way it does? If it is, then it's simply not democracy. It's duopoly. Democracy is defined as a system of government by the whole population, where all the eligible members of a state, through elected representatives, not just a few, but by all of them. If around 240 million Americans are eligible to vote, but just around 130 million Americans vote, then where are the others? Where is the whole population of the so-called democracy? What about the rest of America? Where is the rest of America? The rest of America. Let's go find it. Welcome to the rest of America. In this episode, Imran Siddiqui of Justice News speaks with the former mayor of Cranston, Rhode Island, Steve Laffey, to discuss why he announced his candidacy for the 2024 U.S. presidential election. Well, the country is basically bankrupt, and it's not bankrupt 10 years from now or 20 years from now, it's bankrupt today. My family is from Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh was a gigantic industrial city in the, in the country, and uh, started outsourcing all the, the steel work out to China and stuff like that. It put thousands of people out of work, and that really hit hard. The thing is, a lot of people know they, they, they're in a wreck right now, and they're trying to calm their nerves down. You ride by and look at some of these beautiful homes at night, uh, you want to see one light burning <laughs> that's in the bedroom. A lot of people ain't sleeping at night. We're depending on, we're depending on people that don't care about us. And they're making it more harder for us every year. R really just kind of destroying the morale of the American people. It's dividing us in two. I'd like to see them live in the lifestyle we're forced to live in for one month and survive the way we do. I don't know, what are you going to do? The whole world's a mess no matter which way you turn. And it's only getting worse. We're going to go out and meet people from all parts of this country. We're going to travel, we're going to talk to them. I look at it and say we should go tell people that we have solutions. If the question is pick one nation state. But there's global pressure for the United States to get its act together. And you're going to be paying off all this, this, this debt. Because I'm not sure we can turn around overnight. Sorry, well, we're getting two bad choices from bot politicians, we know that. We just want them to do their freaking job that we put them in there to do. You know, I'm risking my life fighting terrorists and I came to my kids in a, in a good school, you know. I don't think we can make a movie about every single thing. I've already gotten calls in. What about the Federal Reserve? What about gold? What about the dollar? I, I think we have to make a movie about so people can have, have some construct in their head. Like, this is how we're going to have to do things. But then they've got to get home to see who's going to be the next American Idol or who's dancing with the stars. And that's great entertainment, but it's not fixing America. Again, some people wouldn't like it. Lots of people wouldn't like it. 
It absolutely has to be done. Hi, I'm Steve Laffey, and I'm running for President of the United States. I'm running because our country needs to directly confront its problems. My party and the elected leaders of our country simply refuse to do so. My background as a financial expert and someone who's worked well in the private sector is what we need now. We don't need just the businessman. We don't need career politicians. We have a financial crisis and we need specific solutions, which I have at stevelaffey.com. Please go there and find out more. Harvard Business School graduate and a proven financial expert. He's an American office holder, author, and filmmaker. At the age of 38, he was the youngest president and chief operating officer of a major financial firm and was directly responsible for the sale of the firm for close to $800 million in 2001. As a mayor of Cranston, Rhode Island, Steve made national headlines several times over the years. As mayor, Steve took over a city with the lowest bond rating in the United States. He initiated the most rapid fiscal turnaround in American history. The bond rating went up eight notches after four years in office. Imagine what could have happened if he stayed longer. Cranston's bankrupt pension system was fixed, with assets rising 500%, while Mayor Laffey also taught the top finance course at the University of Rhode Island. And the best part is that Steve is joining me right now. Thank you so much for being on the show, Steve. Imran, thank you so much. I've, I've read, I've watched your stuff. It's really, it's great. So I'm happy to be on with you. We just wanted to share with the rest of America, uh, presidential candidate, uh, Mr. Stephen Laffey, who's known as Steve Laffey. And we're just glad that you're here with us so we can share uh, what you're doing with the rest of America. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is Steve Laffey and how did he start? Well, I'm a relatively poor kid. I wouldn't put myself in the class of real poverty. We had a struggling family growing up. My father was a tool, makes, tool maker. He had never gotten to go to college. His father was gassed in World War I and was an alcoholic. So my father had a pretty tough life. His, his, his first wife and first child died at the age of 20 during childbirth. So it took him 10 years to get married again. So he was an older father. But I watched him struggle with Japanese imports, um, growing up and I had a very troubled family, which it's hard for people that when they see me talk and try to get information out that generally in my house, I didn't speak. Uh, My oldest brother, uh, John, who died of AIDS when AIDS first came out, had a pretty troubled life and at one point tried to kill me. My brother, Michael, um, diagnosed with schizophrenia at the age of 17, 18, lived, uh, lives uh, mostly in group songs, but actually was locked up in the criminally insane institution in Rhode Island while I was mayor because he tried to burn down the Institute of Mental Health mm-hmm. to escape, which is in Cranston, Rhode Island, while I was mayor. So my sister Mary, diagnosed with schizophrenia, lived in group homes and so forth and passed away. So, um, but outside my house in Cranston, Rhode Island, I had a great neighborhood and I spent most of my time there with no curfew and doing well in school with great friends and people who, parents who served me. I write about this in my book, Primary Mistake. Mr. Ordanker, uh, who was like a father to me, Mr. Bennett, the Bennett famous hockey family where I went across the street. My best friend, Peter, who my oldest son's named after because Peter died and drowned with with his skates on, which was the most traumatic, one of the most traumatic things, except my daughter's cancer that came along eight years ago in my life. But, uh, but I had good public schools and, 
while my father didn't want me to go to college because he didn't know how we would pay for it, um, which is a strange thing to tell people, mm -hmm. I uh, knew I had to want to go to college to break the string of, you know, what was going on in my family. And I wanted to break what my family had done in the sense and have a good family. So uh, I went to Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine. Uh, I only applied to one school, Dave Andrew, my high school AP European history teacher told me to drive up in the summer of 1979 mm -hmm. and visit uh, the director of admissions who he went to school with and they, and they let me in. Uh, my parents didn't come, which was very strange. And Anyway, I did very, very well at school, mm -hmm. as I always did, was president of student council in high school and college, and, um, and ended up at Harvard Business School at the age of 22, even though I had wanted to be Milton Friedman. I wanted to be the next Milton Friedman in economics, uh, but I applied to Harvard Business School because a person who I was graduating with told me at the end of our junior year that nobody could get in directly out of school. And boom, right then I said, well, I'm going to do that. And mm -hmm. And somehow I got in, even though I never took an accounting course, never took a business course, never had a, I mean, my jobs, you know, to go to Harvard Business School were the likes of like scraping pans at a bakery, cleaning a warehouse for three summers at United Parcel Service in Warwick, Rhode Island. So, you know, that's how I grew up. And my, you know, thing that I remember maybe as much as anything from my childhood was my high school principal, Joe Ventitulo, saying to me, I was president of accounts. He said, Steve, the real problem is people like you leave Rhode Island. They never come back. And I always thought about this uh, because, you know, I had a good successful career, mostly at Payneware, but then, mo you know, most of my nine years were at Morgan Keegan, where I had met up with Alan Morgan, the CEO and founder of Morgan Keegan. When I met him, it was about a hundred million dollar revenue firm. And uh, I met him on Good Friday of 1992 at the Pierre Hotel in, mm -hmm. in New York City. And, uh, he looked at me about 15 minutes into it. Now, this was a guy that still sold stocks as an institutional salesman. Sort of like you meet the, the president or CEO of IBM and he's still selling computers back mm. in the day. Very unusual, honest. Anybody could look up to Alan Morgan. So he looked at me in about 15 minutes into talking to me and he said, and I won't say exactly what he said because I won't swear, but he said, hey, I thought this was just another BS meeting that, that Graves <laughs> set up for me. But, but but why don't you come down and be my partner? And I said, yes. I said, I have to. He said, what do you want? I said, I just want to tell you. I told him how much I made. I said, I want to tell you, just let me make $1 more next year. And so I can tell my wife. This is my first wife, Sabrina. And so he said, okay. And it was really a handshake. I don't remember anything really being written down. Of course, I made much more than what I making, what I was making because I knew I would, by the way, working with Alan Morgan. And it had one of those things where for nine years, even though uh, my first wife left me, which was extraordinarily traumatic and took my five-year-old son, Peter. Um, but for nine years in the workforce, I did whatever I wanted. If I were to say to Alan Morgan, Alan, um, I'm going to go to uh, Scandinavia to get some business, which the firm had never done. He'd be like, why? I said, well, I think boop, boop, boop. And I'd go through a story. He'd be like, okay. I did international business with Alan. And then when I said to Alan Morgan, Alan, I need to be in management because one day I have to run the firm. So it has to happen relatively soon with the biggest producers in the firm. And he always had a way of dissing this stuff like, oh, don't worry. You're so young. I said, no, Alan, in six months, I either have to leave. You have to leave management. I'm, he I'm here to run the firm one day. <laughs> he would, and so he would he would literally go, OK. And then, boom, I was out of the research department. Mm -hmm. And because of him and John Stokes, you know, Stokes was his vice chairman. But if you met him, you think you were met meeting, you know, um, you know, uh, Civil War Southern general with a beard and everything. It's John Stokes, deep voice. Mm. And he taught me a lot of stuff that I wish we, I wish Donald Trump had learned. But he taught me a lot of stuff like, Steve, you're taking over research. Now, listen, anybody, you, you're going to interview everybody. And anybody that doesn't fundamentally disagree, that fundamentally agree with you, we got to get rid of. <laughs> after three months, after three months, it's your problem. <laughs> and so he was right. See, this is the whole thing about management. Yeah. Right? So I, I would I would come back to him and say, we got to get rid of these two people. He go, well, now listen, we don't throw people out in the street. So Mr. Fish, we're going to get him a good severance and we're going to do this. But you're right. You're right about this. And so Alan would be distant on this. You know, he wouldn't really care. And then I would set forth uh, in, in one of my gifts is, is to is to figure out how to put the right people in the right place at the right time and get the results we wanted. And I went to Alan John Stokes as research head. And I said to them, listen, we have to gather assets. 
we can't just be a commission. This is before the internet. This is 90, 90 end of 96, right? Mm. 95. And, uh, and so they're like, what? I'm like, no, no, no. The whole thing's going to change. So we need a product like this focus list where we pick the stocks that wins, that gets assets, that we market. So I became, other than what they were doing in the past, I made myself the sole decision maker because when you have five people making decisions, no one really cares. Mm. It, it, just the way it works in business. So, so we changed it. And we also changed uh, the way the analysts did business. It used to be, even brokerage firms today, they try to hide behind um, um, you know, rating systems. Mm. And they'll say, outperform, semi-outperform, mostly outperform. <laughs> but no, no, no. It's outperform the S&P 500, market perform, underperform, and whatever is O, outperform the S&P 500. Every three months, if your stocks that you say will outperform the S&P 500, do outperform the S&P 500, you're going to get a check, a bigger check. Mm. And we changed the compensation to reward stock picking. And guess what? A year and a half later, Joe Kernan, CNBC, 1997 in the summer, picks up the newspaper and says, Morgan Keegan has the best stock pickers in America, not Morgan Stanley, Morgan Keegan. Mm. And, and so that product, that product helped us gather assets. So I know I'm only talking business, but then, you know, it, I took, that's how I took over every division. You know, I took over the trading after they lost $4 million. I took over institutional sales. Um, I was made president chief operating officer after literally telling Alan, Alan, I need to be the president of the firm. They had left it empty for three years after uh, Bill Dupree, one of the founders, retired. And he says, oh, you know, Alan had this way about him. You're too young. You're too this. <laughs> and I laugh about it now because that's just his way. It's still his way. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. And I would say, no, I'm not. And I would say to him, Alan, you fly at 40,000 feet and all these Memphis people, I'm the only one educated basically north of the Mason-Dixon line. I'm the only one who talks like this <laughs> with a Yankee accent. And so, and so he would be, I would said, I'm the crop duster. You know how we argue in meetings and people are horrified? He goes, yeah, why, do, why is that? Because they kiss your butt. They think that's the way to the top. Me, I'm just telling you the truth, mm. and whether you like to hear it or not. And so next day he comes walking back in. Okay, you're going to be the president and the chief operating officer. We've never had one before. I need you to get to the bottom of everything going on in this firm, where all the money is and so forth. Mm -hmm. But give me a month. Don't tell anybody because there's about a dozen people who think they're going to be president. And I've got to make sure they think this is good. He was a genius at this. but And I never told my wife, my second wife, Kelly. And... Um, and um, I never told anybody. Like he said, in a month later to the day, he walks in and says, okay, we're going to do this tomorrow. So-and-so is going to be this. Someone's going to be that. Everybody got something. But I became the president, the chief operating officer. Just like he said, you could take it to the bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did the whole review of the firm. And, and the real inside story is that I, I literally said to Alan, I did this whole Harvard Business School review of the firm. And I said to Alan, First of all, I went to three other people who owned about 10% of the stock. And I talked to them and I said, um, listen, it's way better for you guys who are 60 to sell the firm. It's way better for the employees to be under a different umbrella because the changes that I have to make are going to make the stock prices go down if we're going to get to $2 billion in revenue. It's going to go down for like five years because we're going to do radically different things. And, I, and again, I'm happy to do it. It's really good for me. It's terrible for you guys who are 60. You probably want to retire before this is done. Mm. And I believe you all forget what I'm saying here today, three years from now, as we struggle through the changes to get the $2 billion of revenue. And so, and so the three of them, Joe Weller, the CFO, says, did you tell Alan this? Alan's sitting in another room. I said, no, if you three think it's a terrible idea, I'm not going to bring it up to Alan because we don't have the votes. He said, no, no, bring it up to Alan. And so I go to Alan, walk in, close the door. He sees me close the door and he goes, Oh crap! He doesn't. He's, you know, he's <laughs> and, and and I and I say, Alan. He says, "You're not quitting," because I've never closed the door. And I say, Alan, this is the most important discussion we're ever going to have. We've been together for eight or whatever years. And I tell him the other people think you trust me the most. Here's the meeting I had. Would you sit through another meeting tomorrow at twelve noon? And and don't, and pretend I never had the meeting because they're just you know you intimidate people. Not me, but everybody else it looks like. So he says, okay. And we have the same meeting. And I go through this Harvard Business School color-coded sheet about assets and this and that, return on equity, where it's going, what the bond division does. And I tell him the same thing. And he looks over to Joe Weller, who he's been with for 30 years. And he says, Joe, what do you think? And Joe says, I think Steve has a point. We're an awkward size. Now, he knows that means sell the firm. Laffy's right. <laughs> because Joe would never say Laffy's right. 
So we, so the next week, Alan woke up to me and said, we're going to sell the firm to Regents Financial, keep everybody together, and instead of paying Weber for a dollar less per share than we would have gotten, and you're in charge of the whole thing. And anyway, from that step forward, I ran the whole thing. We sold, we ended up selling the firm. And through a confluence of events, I actually got to leave. I, I really promised I'd never get into why what really happened. It's not the article that's out there. But I went to – now, remember, I've, I've, my first wife has left me. I have one child. I've remarried. Uh, and it's a whole wonderful, wonderful story uh, about meeting Kelly Laffey who walks up to my front step. But I can tell you that in a little bit. But, but I go to, I go to Stover Vermont to start a hedge fund. And I've checked out and I've cashed out. And it's not, I'm not the richest guy in the world, but I'm fine. And hmm. now I'm 39, I guess. And, um, and I'm on the side of a mountain. And I try to buy three houses to start a hedge fund and live there in Stover Vermont. And no, no one will sell me one. And I have this vision that I don't, you know, I don't get visions. I, I'm like, I'm like, I'm, I believe God gave me a vision to go to Cranston, Rhode Island. And I told my wife, I think God wants me to go to Cranston, Rhode Island. And I don't want to go. Remember, I didn't want to go back ever, ever. Like, I just, and we went the next day. <laughs> and we went the next day. And I, and I, and my wife, literally, my beautiful wife, I have five more children. And my wife goes down Tallman Avenue and across the street is my childhood friend, Craig Hollingsworth. And, you know, and she says, I love this house on the right. I'm like, honey, we live in an 8,000 square foot home. This is 1300 square foot. It's not for sale. What, what do you mean you want to buy this home? She says, I want to buy this home. I said, we couldn't fit our furniture in the front door. We can't get the piano in the house. What are you talking about? She goes, no, I really like this home. So and I run a drive around. On September 10th, how I remember this is 1911. Craig calls and says they're going to sell the home. And once you go over there right now, I said, Craig, it's 10 o'clock at night. He goes, go over there now. They're right there. Go over the house. Knock on the door. How much do you want for the home? Walking around, I'm horrified. That we, by the way, it's a beautiful little home. I'm just horrified that I can't get any furniture. In. <laughs> and, 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 and my wife's got her thumbs up behind me. She can't keep a straight face. She loves the home. Three bedrooms, one bath. A bedroom that I'm going to sleep in for nine years that when I get off on the right-hand side of the king-size bed, I smash into a wall. Okay? So, <laughs> so again, I'm not, I, I grew up with nothing. It doesn't bother me. It's probably fine, but I'm like, what are we doing? And so he says, I want $154,000. I shake his hand. I'm like, all right, we buy the home. And we buy the home, and that's it. That's where I live for nine years. And about two months later, not, still not knowing why I'm in Rhode Island, Cranston's missing $10 million oh. in an article. So I go over to City Hall. I walk in. And I said, give me an audit. I, and they said, they don't have one. They don't have one for three years. I said, ma'am, ma'am, we're not talking about a hamlet with eight people living in. 83,000 people live in this city. It's illegal. Not, I, I, I come from this business. Hmm. I understand, it's illegal not to do it. Well, the computers have been slow. They hand me a 1998 audit. Oh. This would have been October of 2001. I called my wife who went back to Memphis. Our, our home was selling, I guess. And she was back in Memphis for a couple of days with the kids. I said, I know why I'm here. I'm going to be the mayor. The city's going bankrupt. They just haven't told everybody. Man. Anyway, I become the mayor. And I become the mayor. Um, it's in my book, Primary Mistake, where no one wants me to run the Cranston Republican Party. In fact, they tell me I can't run. And I think there's some like law that I can't run because it might be a residency requirement, right? But no, they have their hand-picked candidate. This is the corruption I've dealt with from the very beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And I say, I finally figured out, and the guy who's supposed to run, hand-picked guy, he starts crying and he, he runs out and they left with me. And the city does go to the lowest bond rating in America as I run. And the Providence Journal keeps putting Cranston financial crisis on the top of every article, giant letters, big red letters, Cranston financial crisis. I jokingly say Cranston East basketball beats Cranston West basketball, Cranston financial crisis. It wasn't quite like that, but everybody is now focused mm. in something that hasn't been seen in a long time in America where you have a debate for mayor. And 1,300 people try to get into a room that holds 800 people, Cranston East Student House, uh, the, the, the main room in Cranston where I went to high school, the auditorium. And, and so I win the race, to be the short version. I win the race. I'm not supposed to win. And I win it on a, on a program that goes like this. I'm Steve Laffey. I'm a financial expert. I grew up here. I will fix it. And you're not going to like anything I'm going to do. Man. And that's, that's the campaign. And, and, and you'll like it. You won't like it. You won't, I'm Steve Laffey. You know, I didn't come home to live in Detroit. These are the phrases that I said a hundred times over and over again. 
And but when I'm done, you'll thank me. And so we win the race, we fix everything, and 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 by the way, the things that I remember are not really fixing the city financially, you know. But I put the right people in the right place at the right time, you know. Uh, for example, uh, I, I know to get the bond rating up, I need a finance director who knows what he's doing. I call S and P, I call I call um, other rating agencies, Moody's. Said, who's the best finance finance director in America? And they're like, um, it's Jerry Barron. I'm like, who's Jerry Barron? Well, he's in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Well, Bridgeport, Connecticut's not too far. So, so by the way, Bridgeport, Connecticut declared bankruptcy in 1992, and he went there to turn it around. Mm. And they had an A bond reading, and it's not a very nice city, Bridgeport, Connecticut. I'm not making fun of the people in Bridgeport, but physically, it's a disaster. And Cranston's not. Cranston's like seemingly looks normal. So I take the order to general. I grab the order to general. We drive to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and by the grace of God, Jerry Barron has a home in North Kingstown, Rhode Island, and we convince him to come back and be the finance director. And he's about a six foot seven, four hundred pound man. And part of his contract, he needs like a special car that he can sit because he's so giant. And anyway, he's a he's a wonderful man, and he's very helpful to get the bond rating up. But see, that's what I do. Like, I think these things through. All the time, like I'm always thinking these things through. How do I do this? What would be the focal point? What would be the, what would really matter to get the bond rating up? Because if we can't get the bond rating up, remember the city of Cranston was borrowing three month money at tax accruing rates of 15% before I was mayor. Three month money at, tw- so, so I would walk around campaigning sometimes with a baseball bat because people would say, Mr. Laffey, you know, what's really going on? I said, well, you know how someone might lose you know, betting on football five straight weeks in a row and you didn't pay the bookie and a guy named Vinny shows up with a baseball bat. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I go, it's something like that. That's how bad it is. That's how I, I mean, I have a gut, because of where I grew up and how I grew up, I have a guttural way of explaining things, you know, that, you know, I didn't go to Deerfield Academy. I went to Cranston High School East. And um, um, so that's how I am and was very successful. And But I don't really remember so much the financial stuff, and it gets into why I'm running for president. I remember things like there's a flood in Cranston, and I'm, I'm trying to stop the flood and bring up sandbags. And I'm, you know, a lady drives into the flood, and she, I'm yelling, "Don't drive in there!" Ruins her car, and I got to get her out. And a kid, and we put her in my car, and she's scared that her husband mm. is going to be so upset because they destroyed the car. And we get her back to the house, and I tell the husband there was no way she could have avoided it. It just happened so fast. <laughs> And of course, it's it's a bald faced lie. I mean, I'm not, you know, and she's like, gives me a hug because the husband's now not all the way home. These are things that you remember, you know, uh, I remember, uh, I don't know if you know about my, my travels to Guatemala or to Mexico, into into Mexico, but those are like the focal point. You know, um, I, I, I become the mayor and in January, February, March of becoming mayor, a guy wants to see me and I'm like, sure, Gordon Duke, come on in. And Gordon comes in. And he's shown me photos from Guatemalan newspapers of what ambulances look like. He's got a stack of them. And I'm like, oh, he's going to ask me for some money. And I'm going to give him some money. It must be some charity. And he's like, look. And so the, so the, the ambulances on ambulances, they're pickup trucks. And I'm like, okay, this is great. He goes, well, Mayor, I've spent years. I'm a former province fireman. Years trying to get somebody to donate some extra vehicles, ambulances, mm. uh, fire engines, rescue vehicles, anything to Guatemala so that they could have something to put people in rather than pickup trucks when a flood comes or someone breaks a leg in the rural areas. I'm like, mm. okay. I pick, up, I pick up the phone. I call the fire chief. I said, chief, do we have anything extra like an ambulance we could give to someone? He goes, yeah, we do. I go, what is it? He goes, an ambulance. Why can't we use it? Well, it's too old. Legally, we can't use it. Can we just give it to someone? They want to go to Guatemala and help people. It goes, yeah, it's less worth less than whatever, a thousand bucks. So we can do what we want. We don't have to go out to bid. I said, okay, can you get it ready for this guy? He'll come pick it up and take it to Guatemala. He says, okay. I said, can you put some tires on? He's got to drive it all the way to Guatemala. <laughs> he says, okay. Oh. And, and, so, and so, so here's the story. The following Friday, he comes by, and I think it's going to be Gordon Duke and maybe a guy. It's not Gordon Duke and one guy to drive it. It's like 150 to 200 Guatemalan Americans. There's Miss Guatemala, Rhode Island with a baton and a crown. People are singing. People, people are dancing. Mm-hmm. And they have people with, with, with real documents from Guatemala saying they can bring this to Guatemala. And I'm stunned. I'm like, stunned. I have no idea. I'm busy with the financial stuff. 
And people are yelling, El Carde, El Carde, which I guess means mayor in Spanish, right? Not the mayor, just the mayor. <laughs> and so off they go. And, and by the way, all of a sudden, he says to me later in the year, now reading mass, they got to give me a filing. I use the Republican Christian conservative as the ax to get people to give me stuff. They wouldn't even meet with me. When I say Steve Laffey, Republican, they're like, oh, no. So by December, I found them six more vehicles. And I lead a parade of 21 vehicles to go to Guatemala out, out of the city. <laughs> so, by the way, I become so popular that Democrats are going crazy. Like, what's going on? I become with 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 Guatemalan Americans, or these people all just people hardworking people. I'm on Guatemalan radio stations that happen in people's basements in Cranston in Providence, and someone has to translate because I took five years in Spanish, but I can speak four words. So, um, so it gets. By the way, it gets to the point where now, um. I, we find an old fire engine that needs to be fixed up. My buddies and I contribute like five grand. We give it to a Guatemalan guy. And now the Democrats say, oh, no, this is too much. They try to sue me. They go after me, the Democrats, which is a giant mistake. What? They, they don't want me to do this. They say I'm stealing from the city. So I have to hire a – luckily in Connecticut is the guy who evaluates fire engines for the nation, I guess. And we get him, and I pull up a – you know, I have a big press. This is all in the press, by the way, all stories, all in all over Rhode Island, where I hold up this thing and say, we just spent $1,500 to find out this fire engine was worth 600 bucks. Mm -hmm. Like you people are clowns, you know? So this stuff happened all the time, but I remember, and by the way, it went, if you go to, I think if you go to Antigua, Guatemala today, that thing is there. Now they want me to go to Guatemala on a diplomatic mission. I go and meet president Azul, who's now the mayor of Guatemala city, the former president. We give him gifts. He gives us gifts. We go to Antigua, where it becomes a sister city. So these things are like, you know, these are things that these people have finally had someone who said, someone's paying attention to me. Hmm. Like like the Guatemalan Americans in Rhode Island. Like someone's paying attention. We're not forgotten people. These are the things I remember the most. I know I went on too much, but this is who I am. This is why I, you know, this is why I'm doing what I do and why I haven't started to make money ever again. Um, because these people are what really drive me, whether it's the people from the movie. And I'll stop there to tell you, but that's, that's me. That's, this is, these are the things I remember, you know. Um, and then, of course, I left Rhode Island after losing a Senate race. And, and that's a whole story to the book and whatever. But, you know, I, 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 I left in 2010, and I left after giving a speech that went something like this. You really only want me when you have a financial crisis and you want to fix it. In Rhode Island, you don't want to fix it. But I can't bring my children up here. It bothers me too much to watch the whole state crumble, but I don't see any way to victory to become the governor for, 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 for me because you people don't want to fix it. Cranston did. But I thought, and by the way, I thought if you, like in business, if you fixed an entire city, you paved the roads again, you, you, you took the park cinema and helped the guy rebuild. This is the giant cinema that was bankrupt that all of Rhode Island knows right outside of City Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, a wonderful man, Patel, put in $11 million cash to rebuild it. And... And basically, by the way, the people in the city council, like they hated him because he was an Indian American with a thick accent of a mustache. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I think racism in Rhode Island is way worse than in the Deep South. I always felt this way when I came back home. Um, so so th this is who I am. This is the rest of America. I'm globalcrossover.com and justicenews.net with Imran Siddiqui in Washington, D.C. You're listening to a conversation with the former mayor of Cranston, Rhode Island, Steve Laffey, the Republican presidential candidate for 2024. Well, while I was in, you know, I moved here, I bought a 36 acre ranch and now I have, I have all these kids. I've got six kids now and, uh, you know, I'm in. I go to the Sundance Film Festival. It's 2011. And all of a sudden, there's a guy ahead of me. I'm going to do a radio show. And a guy who made the movie Margin Calls ahead of me, and he made it, wrote it in Rhode Island. And all of a sudden, again, put on my heart right then, I'm going to make a movie. We're going to travel the country and find people on the sides of roads 
who can really, really explain to us in America what's really going on. Yeah. And so that's the movie Fixing America, which which played around the country, and I became a keynote speaker. And Basically what you're saying is Steve Laffey is a kind of guy who rolls up his sleeves and gets to work to get things done. Yeah. And he doesn't care about the color of your skin. No. Because he's out there to help everyone in America and even outside of America possibly so that they could be happy in their own hometowns and their cities and they don't even have to go anywhere. Yeah. Now you're running as a US presidential candidate for 2024. So what made you decide to run for the US presidency and what do you think is going on in America right now? Well, the people in the movie <sighs> Fixing America continue to haunt me. Anybody could watch a clip of it. You could watch the movie yourself. It's still on Amazon. You could, you know, it's an older movie. Without the dead clock, you think I made it yesterday, but that was a very powerful film because it talked about a lot of the stuff that had not even occurred, which did after that movie. Yeah, and did I, I? The movie is about China becoming too powerful, and we need to stop trading with them. And it's about the budget deficits that will overwhelm America, which again they are. And that's why I'm running because <laughs> it's happening now. And I said it would 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 happen, and and it's about the people who are so disaffected. And the t subtitle of my movie, Fixing America, is "You Are Not Alone." Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that half of America feels like they're alone. In mm -hmm. other words, just take one issue of campaign finance. If you're if you're someone who makes sixty five thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, you have two kids. If you make a hundred thousand dollars in New York City, you're working class poor. You know, you're you're working. If you make seventy thousand dollars in Youngstown, Ohio, you might feel like you have some money. But what I'm saying is, someone is doing this, and they know that something has gone radically wrong in the country. It used to be that one person went to work, one person kept an eye on the kids. Now both people are going to work. Mm. And no one's keeping an eye on the kids, even though they want to. Believe me, they love their children, right? Yeah. And and that gets to, gets to the, all the things I talk about, the public schools, the Federal Reserve, all these things. But but just take campaign finance where they say to themselves, I love to help an election. I've, I've got $100 this year that I could allocate. I've got $500 this year that I could allocate to a city council race, a U.S. congressional race. I could give $200 here. But the Koch brothers are giving $70 million to this race mm -hmm. on the right side of the spectrum. And George Soros has given $60 million. What the hell am I going to do? Mm -hmm. That's what people think. They're like, how could I make a difference? And they give up, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, they see the PPP program happen, and they see $800 billion get spent. And it goes to friends of J.P. Morgan. Even NBC calls it the greatest fraud of, the ge of a generation. Mm -hmm. So remember, who voted for it? Well, every U.S. Republican senator, right? Uh, that means Rand Paul. That means Tim Scott. Who signed off on it? That would be Donald Trump. Who got totally hosed by the inflation, of course? Hmm. That would be every other American making 75 grand who had to absorb a $4,000 increase in energy cost alone for two straight years. Hmm. They can't afford that. That means they can't paint the home. That means they can't go see their relative in Vermont for a vacation. That's what it really means to real people that I grew up with. And that's why I'm running because people can't take this pain they can't take this not feeling connected. They, they don't know what to do. They're totally disconnected. It's half the country, maybe more than half the country. And that's why I'm running, because what we have to do is restore the middle class. Hmm. Remember, the middle class was set up after World War II, in a sense, with the GI Bill, people coming back home from the war. They could go to college. They could buy a home. And it was set up to do that. And then it was totally destroyed for three, three, in three ways. And probably 20, but the three ways, and the reason I'm running and the reason that stevelaffey.com, it's right there in front of you, of, of the major issues. One would be the school systems. Public schools used to be good. Mm -hmm. And many parents think that their school system must still be good. There must have been a PTA meeting sometime you know, in the last 10 years. I just missed it. I'm too busy. Folks, there was no PTA meeting. They don't have them anymore. Mm. They, they don't have parents come in and get involved. They don't want you there, right? And yeah. someone's watching a rerun of Little House on the Prairie and saying, oh, my school's sort of like that. No, it's not. There's policemen in schools. The whole thing is gone. School and it's not about, happening. by the way, just – yeah, it's not about, by the way, the Republican governors who say it's woke, it's woke. 
that's six problem. And if they fix the wokeness, quote unquote, whatever that means, the governor of Virginia, the governor of Florida, they, they still have terrible public schools. Mm. So what, the system can't be fixed. So that's one way the middle class was destroyed. When, when, when he, but for example, take right now the last two months. What happened? We just learned that civics taught in public schools, there are 13% of the kids who are proficient. Not 33, 13. So think about that number 13. And 20% are proficient in history and the worst math and reading test scores of eighth graders that we've ever seen in the country. Just now right now just happened what's the solution well there's no solution <laughs> there's not a republican candidate for president who has a solution right except for curing the wokeness i suppose right mm. um the, the the solution is it can't be fixed I, wait, I listen i'm 10 years ahead of my time on this one but i'm right the cost structure of public schools is like in denver twenty three thousand dollars a kid some of this stuff could be for free. Think of the federal government. Think about how they, they must hate your children. There's something called the internet, folks. It can do Algebra 1 with the best Algebra 1 teacher for free. Like mm -hmm. if little Johnny, little Saul, little Sally misses a class because they're sick, they could watch the 15-minute video. Seriously. So it doesn't exist, though, does it? This doesn't no, exist for people. No. no. So, so a lot of the stuff could be free. The cost structure for property taxes could be taken down. Everybody knows this. No one will do it. Yeah. Instead, and here's the thing on radio shows I talk, I, I actually stop. It, it stops the conversation. I get, I get asked, hey, back in northern Colorado again, uh, they're thinking of having a vote of whether to put uh, policemen back in this particular school system. And like, stop. Think about what you're saying. The fact that someone's school needs a policeman means something went radically wrong in the United States of America. So you have that. So the schools. So so by the way, think of this thing with 13 percent of proficient in civics, which civics. Let's get down to what it really means. Do we have a republic? Do we have a monarchy in America? You know, do you know, do you know? It means that some places have to be near zero, like Detroit, like Memphis, because some schools are going to be in New Canaan, Connecticut, I'm guessing they're going to be 70 percent proficient, proficient, by the way, not experts, proficient. Mm -hmm. So. The answer is, is, is nothing. We move on to cocaine in the White House in this, in this country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why I'm running for president. If you take that combined with what happened to our manufacturing jobs from the World Trade Organization allowing China to be in under the Bush and Clinton administrations, both wanting it because giant corporations ended up being lobbyists for China and manufacturing jobs leaving our country in droves. Not that we can manufacture everything all the time. I get it. That's why we have Mexico for mid-level stuff. and you know, We have allies and so forth. But the growth of what happened in China to make sure that short-term profits and that CEOs became near billionaires over it destroyed the middle class from the, from, for the last 25, 30 years. And then if you add in the Federal Reserve, which, which on purpose – and by the way, people say, Steve, do you really mean on purpose – I really mean, and listen carefully, the Federal Reserve on purpose has destroyed the middle class. Mm -hmm. They are there to serve elite people. How do I know this? You're talking to someone who taught the top finance course at the University of Rhode Island and never took a note. I know all of this stuff. And it's easy to keep inflation at zero. Easy, folks. It has to do with the money supply and the velocity of money. Everybody knows this. They simply refuse to talk about it. And so the money supply is starting to head back up. It's come down the last year. But it was easy to say on radio in April of 2020, we're going to have inflation at, at nearly 10% easily. And we did. Why would Jerome Powell, the head of the Fed, in June of 2021 say, I think by the end of 2021, inflation will run at 3.6%. And it ran at 7.9%. How could it be off by three standard deviations? He knows. He knows this. He just needs a way to bail out really rich people. That's, That's why they hate deflation. So, so these three things are the main culprits of destroying the middle class and need to be changed, along with, along with by the way, a bunch of other stuff. Hmm. But I'm running because I know how to fix this. I know how to put the right people in the right place at the right time. I know how to expand the middle class. I know this is – by the way, I know the only way to unite America – is over enlarging the middle class as a mission. As a mission. This is this should be the mission, except nobody else wants to do it. Now, the people of America want to do it. By yeah. the way, even a lot of rich people want to do it. 
And then the second part of it is how do we get people out of poverty? Think about this. Hmm. If you look at the marginal tax rates of getting people out of poverty, let's, I give you 4 million examples, but that's hyperbole, obviously. But I can give you a thousand examples where literally, take one. You have someone who's on social security disability because they're truly disabled and they're getting $600 a month. They're living with their parents or somewhere and they can't keep more than $2,000 in an account. Otherwise they can't get the money, but they want to get out of poverty. So they go out and take a job and make $10,000 at the local Sam's Club mm. where they can just stand there for six hours a day, not too strenuous. They're trying to do it. What's going to happen later that year? Mm. They're going to get a letter from the Social Security Department saying, we want $5,000 back from you. Seriously, man. They got put into a 50% marginal tax rate, much higher than any hedge funds carried interest, right? That we argue about all the time in, in, mm. in, in Washington, which they never change. What if you have a housing allowance? I'm not saying I'm for or against housing allowances. I'm saying, what if you have one and you earn an extra dollar more? You lose the entire housing allowance. Hmm. So, so all of a sudden you have you get kicked out of the house, the housing place, because you made one dollar more. You have like a thousand percent marginal tax rate. These things exist. Why can't they be changed? That's why I have a nine 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 program for taxes. All these things make a lot of sense. No one really argues with me over this stuff. They just don't want me to be heard. <laughs> yeah, uh, they don't. They don't want you to speak, let alone be heard. But one of the things that I saw in your video, which blew my mind, that you did about ten years ago, was the fact that you're one of the only guys who talked about um, the U.S. debt and balancing the budget. I mean, yeah. you you were one of the only guys who talked about balancing the budget, as far as I can remember, and you made it sound so easy. And it made sense. So tell us a little bit about that. What is going on with the U.S. debt and, and what's going on? Why can't the government balance the budget? Well, it can't. It can. it just so, so back in 2011 when I made the movie, I sat down actually where I'm sitting right here today. And I said to John Dodenoff, who helped me make the movie, I said, listen, before we go on the road, let's just balance the U.S. budget. Now, then it was like $700 billion, whatever it was. And, it, and it's at stevelaffey.com. It's at fixingamericamovie.com. Hmm. Uh, where you could just watch me balance the button. Now, you can watch me now say how I took $700 billion out of the structure of the United States of America. And and and, and we do it in like 11 minutes. Yeah. And, you know, I have documents in front of me. We have ways to do it. And and I say at the end of the video, yeah. a lot of people wouldn't like it. It has to be done. But to take it to the next level, what the movie has a little scene where we kind of say when we go past borrowing $20 trillion of debt, and now we're borrowing about $24, $25 trillion of debt because some of the money gets, not to confuse people, but the national debt clock is much bigger than that at $32, $33 trillion. But, uh, but what we borrow at, the amount of money. Now, I've always said, and there's a video that says, boom, you know, something like once we cross $20 trillion. And so we've crossed $20 trillion, So here's the real problem without a lot of pain that people have to understand, no matter what. Mathematically, we can't get back to normal. In other words, let's talk about just $20 trillion of outstanding public debt and say we borrowed at the, say we went back to normal. Normal is that the United States of America borrows at roughly 6% over the last 35 years. Forget the last 12. The last 35 years on average, we borrow, and we borrow by issuing on average 15-year treasury bonds because we have 30 year bonds and we have one day, one month bills, right? Mm -hmm. And what we call notes that treasury notes start at one year, let's say. So right now the situation is this, what if we borrowed at normal on 24 trillion at six plus percent folks, we've already gone from $250 billion in interest costs by keeping rates at zero borrowing on average at six years, not 15 years. So the rate, what we call duration risk, you know, the fact that we're borrowing so much short term because no one wants it. No one wants it. No one wants 30 year bonds, all of them at, at, at 3%. They'd want 10 if we had to issue all of them at um, 30 years. So we have a duration risk that's happened and we have the amount of debt that's now 24 trillion. Yeah. So we would actually effectively have to take interest rate, interest on the, on the, as part of our budget, which at 250 billion went to 337 billion, and this year will be about 700 billion. Now remember, Social Security is near a trillion, so we're approaching a number that's going to approach Social Security payments. So 
it's what we call the crowding out effect finally happening. It's finally happening because now if we went to normal, say 6%, the interest on the debt would be 1.3, 1.4 trillion. Mm -hmm. That would be the biggest line item in the budget by far. Now, that's an extra trillion over, say, four years ago. Yeah. But we haven't grown the economy by a we haven't grown the, the the amount of money we take in and receipts by a trillion. So where is it coming from? Well, it can only come from people accepting more dollars. Now, the question is, and I don't know the answer, at what day, what time will everybody wake up and say, I don't want any more dollars? This is too much, even for America. I mean, it's, it's happening outside of America. Yes. Yeah, other countries are ditching the dollar and they're trading in their own currency. Yeah, and you're going to see more of this happen. And it's and it, the, the thing that to tell people again is that lots of this stuff happens slowly, 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 and then really fast. Mm -hmm. A lot of bad things, whether it's World War One, boop, 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 World War One. People die. A lot of people die. Right. So Pearl Harbor happened really fast. We were in a, we were in a war. We were getting ready for a war, but we happened now. You take if someone wanted to go back and see what happened to interest cost in Greece, now, Greece is not America, I get it, or Spain. It wasn't like interest rates back in 08, 09, 10, whatever, went up slowly and people said, oh, we have a real problem with our 10 year. No, we, they used to be 2%. Now they're three over the year. No, it was like two, three, 12. And there was a crisis. Yep. That's what's going to happen to America. And so it's going to happen because our banks are so leveraged. Another thing we haven't talked about. Again, I'm the only person talking about this. Like, you can't, we can't find someone who says something about this, but our banks are really the real big problem that, that they blow up every year. And we bail out the bank CEOs. They maintain their wealth. The shareholders don't go broke like they should. And we have more regulation. That means the largest five banks take more and put out of business small banks. So, for example, in 2008, before the last crisis, the five largest banks had roughly percent of American assets, way too big. Mm -hmm. Today, after regulation, they have 70 percent, same five banks mm -hmm. of, of U.S. assets. Mm -hmm. Is that crazy? It's crazy. It is How crazy. could we? So they're obviously way too big to fail. And we need a different system. Limited purpose banking, break up the banks. There's a lot of things we could do and, and we should do. But there's no interest in doing it because most candidate gets to the, get their money from these large corporations one way or the other through the individuals to a rich CEO saying I'm backing Ron DeSantis, whatever. Right. So that's how they get their money. And this is the conundrum I'm in to run for president. I don't get my money that way. So I'm trying to fix this thing for the, for the people in the movie, for my children. And we haven't talked about my children. I have six of them, but you know, I, you know, and this is not making fun of people who don't run for office, but I'm not a career politician. I simply said to myself when I went back to Cranston and became the mayor, wow, there's a lot of problems. How do I, with my background and my financial background, help people? You know, I'm not a person who invents things. I'm not an inventor. So if I keeled over today, at least we help the people at Cranston. But we really have to have an imprint to help the people of America because within two years, this whole thing ends. Yeah. It, it, and, I, and no, I'm not saying, so you can't, I'm not one of those people who say, buy gold, buy gold. It's going up every day for 25 years. There are people like that. Mm. Peter Schiff says that all day long. By the way, probably a great guy, but that's all he talks about. I, I said in 2011, this could happen if we let it go this far. Mm. The reason I'm running is that we did. <laughs> and so, yeah. so there should be somebody who takes the nation by storm who people say, wait a second. I just read, and p people ask me about my website, stevelaffey.com. Had a guy over here yesterday. Why does your stuff go back to like 2011, 2007? There's videos. It's because you can go back and watch me say something in 2011 that I'm saying today. Yeah. It's not like I changed my mind like Donald Trump or all these people back and forth or about Social Security. I, I've been saying the same thing for nearly 20 years about what has to happen to fix America. Welcome to Global Crossover, the intersection of peace. This is Intersections. Global Crossover, people, energy, and geopolitics.
globalcrossover.com.